Welcome to the Executive Forum 2021 Industry Outlook Media Q&A session. I'm Barb Mitchell and joining me are Christopher Ali, Associate Professor at the University of Virginia, Cara Mullaly, Market Development Manager for Corning, Isaac Feiner, CMO and VP for North America for Cost Systems, and Sam Pratt, CEO of Render Networks. So we just wrapped up uh, an engaging and insightful discussion among our guests. Uh, we just wanted to take a few moments to answer any additional questions uh, that have come to us by our participants and, and from the media. So I'm just gonna start with the first question. Um, we know that we need these networks yesterday. How will tech innovations play a role in saving time and money? Sam, you can take that one if you'd like. Sure, yeah. sure. I, I was just just got, just leaving the option open for others to jump in there, but um, certainly. So, so I think um, Cara framed it quite nicely on the panel, actually. Um, so there's enabling technology, and then there's the technology of the day. So I think if we're looking at enabling technologies, there's um, there's products and platforms um, that that are helping us better understand where to build. Um, there are there are products and, and platforms that are streamlining and automating the design process, um, the deployment process, and also the network operations process. So I think in bringing together the, the, the value chain of those, those technologies, integrating those technologies, that's something that I'm excited about this year is for, um, for instance, us at, at Render to be working more closely with COS systems. Um, for design partners to be integrating directly into solutions like renders and then downstream into network operations for that that end-to-end -end digital data flow actually to enable real-time insights in how we're building these networks in ensuring that folks in the field are able to do six tasks a day instead of five tasks a day because they're not fumbling and looking for you know the construction print um, in the back of back of the pickup truck so um, so bringing together um, and ensuring that that we've got that data consistency end to end and I think geospatial data this 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 year it, it, it was a hypothesis a few years ago could we actually do this um, and, and last year we've accelerated that use case and we've proven out that the, that the value is there. Thank you. Did anyone else wanna add into that? Uh, so the next question, and this can be for anyone, do you think that the funding models in place are sufficient to support the required expansion needs? That's an interesting one. and. Uh... I'll be brief and I'm sure Christopher has some, uh, some thoughts on this as well. When we talk about funding, particularly from a federal level, nobody's ever gonna think it's enough. Um, but even if it seems like a lot and it seems like it should be enough, how it gets applied, the rules, um, the maps, the information is based on, the, it, there's always going to be something that says, um, you know, I, I need more and I'm not eligible. And so I think that at a cursory level, and I think I said this in the panel, there's nothing that's ever gonna service everyone. No one's ever gonna be completely happy. Um, but I think it's, it's important to understand that there are um, a number of different alternative methods to find funding whether that be state funded projects, whether it be different other federal programs through USDA or others, um, whether it's you know, influx through CARES or whether it's just private partnerships or you know, equity firms that are interested in investing in something that they now believe in too. I mean, don't underestimate the, the need and the pain that we've all gone through has hit some of these really wealthy people um, just like it's hit the rest of us. And so um, they're more apt to, uh, to self-invest um, in some of these network opportunities as well. So it, it might feel like it's not enough or it's not being applied appropriately. And, and depending on your circumstances, that may very well be your truth, but um, that doesn't mean it's the only way to get something funded. And I think that was a key theme of our panel. Yeah, and if I, if I could just jump in, I mean, I 
I think, I mean, we do spend a lot of money on on broadband. I, I agree with Kara that it's probably never going to be enough. But I mean, if you think about it, it's five or six billion from the Universal Service Fund, specifically Connect America and Naro Ardoff. USDA controls 1.4 billion in loans and grants. Um, that's a lot of money. We're talking upwards of seven or eight billion dollars a year invested, reinvested into it's specifically just into deployment. Um, I think what we're seeing though is uh, maybe it's not being spent efficiently or democratically. Um, certainly there are problems with the way RDUF money went out uh, certain, or the, the winners were awarded. Certainly there, um, we are seeing some problems being replicated uh, that, that emerged during the CAF2 process. Um, and then over at USDA, uh, these loans and grants are, are really hard to apply for. Um, so we might want to see some streamlining of those application processes, especially for um, smaller uh, smaller providers who you know maybe can't afford to have a lawyer um, or a consultant fill out um, fill out what is required for for USDA. So there is a lot of money there. And then you know it's looking like we're going to get even more. Um, again, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, seven billion dollars. I think the problem is, though, if we just spend, if we just keep spending all of this money the same way we've been spending it, we're not going to get very far. Um, we need to kind of maybe rethink how we're allotting this money, how we're spending it. Um, this even goes to things like Universal Service Fund reform, um, which has certainly been been a, been a hot topic in the last few months, but especially with AT and T's push to do away with contributions. Um, so I'd love to see, uh, you know, this kind of be an ongoing conversations about how this money is actually spent um, and, and maybe think through a lot of reforms around allocation. So on that note, there's another question here that is, is quite closely related, I think, to what you're talking about. And it's a bit longer, so just <laughs> bear with me while I, while I read this question out. A lot of the media coverage over the last year, especially around ARDOF, has been around not wasting the allocated funds. Congress did start to take a new look at rural broadband subsidies, but there's concern that will result in more money for the same wasteful programs. Do you think we will see a review of universal science and implement new ways of promoting coverage where it does not exist so that it directly benefits consumers? Can I jump in here yeah, again? Um, yes. I, I spent a lot of I spent a lot of my days thinking about this stuff. Um, I I do. Um, you know, there's been a big push for if there is going to be a broadband deployment package, either as part of infrastructure or kind of standalone, that the money be given to states rather than flow through FCC or USDA. Um, you know, we we tried that a little bit um, with Recovery Act money. Uh, the the argument here is that states would know better than the FCC or USDA how to allocate this money. So we might start seeing um, some big money be moved um, to stay. So that's something I think we should uh, we should be looking out for, certainly. May I jump in and add something when we're talking about funding? Uh, and uh, I, uh, our company's from Sweden and, and uh, I'm, so I'm from Europe. And I think when, when I'm here, I live in the United States now and, and uh, coming from a small country in Europe, you sort of look at the, the entire world and in the US you look very much at the US and I think something that is uh, um, that is to be shown even more is that you know now when it feels like the US is really waking up when it comes to broadband okay there, there's so much going on right now and so many entities wanting to build and want to step in and, and do something about this problem uh, but I think that this market is ripe for investment and we have seen some investments pure investments in, in in infrastructure coming from europe into the us and in europe in some parts at least they're sort of ahead of the states when it comes to to fiber build outs and connectivity and they have sort of more of seen what the, the revenue and or like the payback can be of this infrastructure when when it gets more well established so to speak so i think uh, we will see way more money that we can't really see right now coming in the future uh, from other parts of the world uh, where they they want to sort of take part of what is happening now. And I, I know of, of investment firms trying to find cases here. So this next question may be a good one for you to, to take as well, uh, just to sort of build on what you're saying um, in some ways. But the question is what role will open access networks play in getting people connected? I know there was some conversation on that on the panel. Um, 
can delve into that a bit more. Yeah, I, I could I could uh, jump in and tie a little bit back to what I said about funding coming from other markets because I I know uh, we have seen open access uh, networks being funded from Europe and I know uh, European private equity is looking to invest in open access networks specifically in in the in in North America and I believe it's because the open access model uh, really drives adoption. And it comes to, you know, if you have, uh, let's say you, you have a choice of one provider and uh, you can pick them while you're, you, you cannot choose anything else. It's what they can provide. And uh, let's say it's a electric co-op. Well, they, they don't want to go in and provide TV and the phone and all those kind of services. They might stick to broadband. If they would operate their network on an open access model, they didn't have to, they could do their internet service and then provide other companies to come in. And what will happen is if you on the network can choose, I can only choose internet. Well, that's decent, like DSL in the past, but I could get the internet. Well, if you're on the network now with maybe not in the beginning, uh, but at least you can choose from a couple of internet providers, a couple of phone providers, a couple of uh, IPTV providers, and then more services coming on. This drives... Uh, take rates. If I have the choice of being on this open ne network with a marketplace full of different kinds of services, would I then prefer to be on a single provider network where, with limited choice and with no competition to drive price down and quality up? No. And that is why I ex especially external investors are interested in, in open access network because they know people will be on those networks, take rates will be high and they will stay on those networks. So it's a, it's a, Builds up to better, uh, better investment, basically with lower risk, um, and that I, I think that will drive the adoption of open access. Uh, um, and uh, the and as I said on the panel, with the, also with the increasing mindset of viewing uh, broadband as infrastructure. I mean, who could imagine going to the American Airlines airport? And then, okay, my next flight is with United. So I have to drive all the way to the United Airports, uh, United Airlines Airport. I mean, it, when you say it like that, it's so crazy, but that's the way broadband works. Or like, okay, cool, I bought a new Ford. So I'm on the Ford Highway. <laughs> Me and all the other guys in Fords. I mean, it's crazy. And then next to it, there's the, there's the you know, Chrysler Highway and, or whatever, Volvo. I must say Volvo Highway, of course, being from Sweden. So, yeah, I think uh, I think it it's just uh, open access. It makes sense, and I think the biggest uh, pushback has been around. Well, you know, it's competing with the private sector, but I would say no. It's in in some sense, yeah, but it's actually enabling the private sector to 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 prosper and and find new markets and expand uh, um, uh, on networks, and it's a way for more people to be able to go in and make this network uh, come become reality. And I think it was Cara that, that mentioned it, build it once, <laughs> build it once and, um, and, and then allow the efficiency of the market to, to provide those services. Um, and like competition is, is what built the United States, you know, but so, so cap, that capitalist mind, mindset create the level playing field and the competition, and and um, the customer is going to win at the end of the day. Agree completely. Not only the customers, also the best providers. Yeah. Very true. All right. Um, unless there's anyone that wants to add anything to that. Um, no. Okay. So I'm going to go on to the next question. And there, you know, I think that there was some conversation around this on the panel as well, but I'm going to throw this to you, Sam, it's specifically, uh, I think to you. So um, there was, as I was saying, there was some talk on the panel about the increased need for digital technology solutions. I think you almost of you agreed with that. Um, can you outline some of the solutions in practice? in some of these solutions in practice and how Render is positioned to solve for this? Some of the solutions in practice, um, certainly. So <clears throat> look, what, what we do at Render is we digitize deployment. Um, and so we focus on the design. We, we, ingest, we ingest the design with the various technologies 
um, and then we optimally allocate tasks and, and, and manage that process sort of as efficiently as, as, as possible. That's what we do at Render. Um, I think the, the question is, what are some of the other solutions that, that are at play in the market? And, uh, and I mentioned um, a couple earlier, um, just around uh, automated design solutions. So, so why would we go through and use engineering services um, to pontificate around an optimal design when we have algorithms that can do that? Um, and that, that that process is is now um, held up as, as, as the right way to go about it. Um, and so I think we're at a point now in 2021 where it's really ask yourself why. Ask yourself why you're not using the optimal approach to, to design the network, um, to assess the demand of the network in, um, in Isaac's case, um, and then to deploy, to, to deploy the physical infrastructure in our case. And um, we sort of naturally, uh, when we're deploying these networks, and historically we have a design phase, well, we have a planning phase, we have a design phase, um, we then have a deployment or a construction phase, and then we think about handover, and then we think about um, think about customer connection and customer um, connection experience. Now that we're using digital tools at just about every step of that value chain, thinking about connection experience before we start construction in design and actually in demand is absolutely necessary. Um, because otherwise you're just you're leaving efficiency on the table. So I think that's what we're excited about at Render, but we're only one element of that value chain. Okay. Um, um, was there someone going to say something? No. No, it was so good. Nothing to add. Okay. Okay. Um, sticking with you, Sam, for a second, uh, you sure. mentioned on the panel, you, you were talking a little bit about the partnership with Springfield. And I know a number of people uh, were talking about the importance of partnerships. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the role Render is playing in bringing the Springfield project to life? Certainly. So, um, and so we, so we are engaged to deliver um, digital construction. Uh, and so what that means is eliminating um, paper from, from, from all ends of that construction process. It means collecting as-built data progressively over the course of the, of the project. And for, for those that are not uh, in the contractor world, that might seem completely obvious, but it's just not the norm and it's, it's not the way things are done. Um, so generally speaking, um, there, is a, uh, there, is a, there is a period of time, there is a duration that is measured in months, not days or weeks, um, in order to compile as-built data and actually transition that as-built data into a network operation system. At Springfield, their delivery partners there realise that that's just, we should not be doing that in, you know, in, 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 it was 2019 then, but in 2020 and certainly not in 2021. Um, and so with a focus on innovation, we were engaged in order to streamline that process. Um, they, they're also working with uh, automated design um, partner BRE Networks, um, whom we at Render work with uh, on a number of other projects. And the overall project is coordinated by the Broadband Group. And Isaac mentions um, open access. Re really, um, the, the ultimate goal for Springfield is also open access, but in order to get there, um, you often need an anchor tenant. Um, and so the way that they've secured um, the, the opportunity to build that network for the people of Springfield is with an anchor tenant and then um, you know, that lease expires and, and then it'll be, uh, it'll be open after that. Hopefully that gives some more color to the example. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, we talked, uh, so with respect, with respect to private equity investment, mm -hmm. uh, the next question's revolving around that, how much of a, a role will this take in funding private equity investment? And well, how will this investment be drummed up? I think it's um, perhaps a piece of people's awareness is that they think that private equity hasn't really been part of what helped build networks for the last uh, decade. And that simply isn't true. So, you know, we've got uh, a number of different financial folks that uh, we recommend our end users to uh, if they mention that they need funding. And those might be people that are willing to invest three or five million, it might be people willing to front 50 or 150 million. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what kind of network build it is. And, you know, another piece too is, we've been focusing a lot on, you know, connecting consumers, end users. A lot of times, 
you still need to build kind of the middle mile, right? The, the loop that any of these communities could even connect into. And so we've seen a lot of, of different funding models uh, through private equity for different values over the years to kind of build out that core infrastructure, that middle mile infrastructure, as well as um, last mile fiber at home type opportunities as well. So I think it will continue to grow. I think um, the opportunity, particularly with open access type networks, where um, you have even some entities that are willing to finance, design, build, operate, right? Where people are stretching their capabilities uh, out of maybe what they would have historically considered their core competency uh, into the other arenas as well to help build networks uh, and to do good uh, in addition to make a buck. So I think, um, I think it'll continue to be a pretty strong play. I would say three or five years ago, like people were beating the public private partnership drum really, really hard. And there were entire conferences around it. Uh, and you started to see broadband um, get a seat at that table, right? Outside of prisons and airports and um, infrastructure like highways into broadband. Uh, and it felt premature then. I feel like we're in the heyday now for that to, to be a really viable funding mechanism. Anyone else want to weigh in on this question? I agree with the sentiment that it's not new. Um, so if you think about the business model that the tower operators, so American Tower and Crown Castle have got and Crown Castle's pushing to Fiverr, so that's happening really, you know, at the Fortune 500 level, um, really investment investment grade assets, and then all the way down the value chain right into tier two and tier three. Um, and not only private equity, but but also um, but also venture venture capital and startup businesses um, that are coming to market with, you know, efficient build at once um, and then farm it out for, you know, for 10, 20 years. And so it is effectively that, that standard infrastructure, you know, discounted cash flow um, that's really appealing to, to financial markets. So it's exciting. Okay, one more question here. Um, what impact do you think satellite technology will have on the industry this year? And I think um, this, Tara, this, this year, well, that's that's a time bound <laughs> wow. this year. That, 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 that's a question right there. <laughs> it's, it's only January. So <laughs> well, I, full I year. Think, Go ahead. I, sorry. I would say it's kind of the uh, akin to what I was saying about about 5G. It's a lot of hype right now. Um, there's a lot of talk. Certainly they want a ton of art off money. Um, it's still, I mean, it's still not living up to the initial expect or to the expectations that were presented to us a year ago or two years ago. I, I imagine that's still going to continue. Um, again, what I worry about particularly is counties and municipalities, particularly rural counties and rural municipalities who might be thinking about changing their broadband deployment plans or not starting a broadband deployment plan because they've heard that a satellite or Leo is just going to show up tomorrow. And, and I'm, I'm, very much concerned that they're going to be and you know kind of ending up waiting for Godot in this moment. Same thing with 5G, right? We need let let's work and plan around the technologies that we know we have. We can think for the best in terms of uh, deployment for um, for Leo satellite uh, service. But again, it just in my mind it has not lived up to the expectations of the media hype that we've seen around it over the last few years. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's the the idea of, you know, proven in a laboratory versus proven in real life. Um, and if we start to see the proof in the pudding, if you will, that um, a satellite constellation can deliver not only gigabit speeds, but gigabit speeds for a number of simultaneous users from a single satellite, uh, you know, depending on location, that to me would make me have a little more confidence in, in the technology, but we are years away, I think, from that being something that everybody pushes the I believe button on. And again, those assets floating up literally in space uh, have a finite life to them. So mm -hmm. all of the money spent on getting it in place, um, it, it has to be refreshed. 
time and time and time again um, if that's going to be sustained. So it's a different, uh, it, it's the completely opposite to build it once. It's to build it many times. And um, that's also something I kind of um, struggle with in, in terms of using your money wisely. Yeah, uh, if I may jump in also, I think uh, I I love the idea with satellite because it can give you the opportunity to to get online anywhere, right? If you're on the top of a mountain and, and you need to be online to do something, you could do so. And it's perfect for that use case. And I think some of the hype has, might have been driven by people are not very, you know, very technology savvy and don't really understand exactly how this technology works. And I, I'm, at, I'm not by far an expert on, on, uh, on satellite internet, but I do understand that sending uh, that information through the air up into the space and then down back again, it's not as fast as fiber. It's just, it's, it's not. And I mean, if you, if you compare it to, you know, I don't know, a, a car, I mean, great. I can take the bus somewhere, but I will definitely, and that's like the satellite, right? Yeah. It gets me there. It's not super fast, but you know, it works uh, compared to, you know, a really fancy car, your own it's, it's, that's the fiber, right? It's uh, it's it's great. It's good, but it it won't give you the flexibility in the in the experience you you might want for your own connection. And tying that back to to what you said, Christopher, if municipalities sort of look at this like, okay, this will give people in my community what they need in terms of broadband. Oh, that's a dangerous thing, right? Because no, we, we I I doubt that the te technology will be able to deliver what people actually want, perhaps ever. Sam, so all, all, all various technologies um, have, have their application. So fiber obviously has its application, fixed wireless has its application and, and is, is required. And I think that use case around uh, agriculture was one um, that, that I found really, really, uh, really interesting, Christopher. Um, and the fact that um, yeah, that there's, I think satellite um, will also have its application, certainly in extremely remote areas. You know, that's that's what's uh, very exciting about the technology. It, it it is it is just inextricably linked to one of the most disruptive individuals um, that has ever lived in our time. Uh, and so I think that is the big uh, X factor for me. And so I can't access, I, I can't answer along 2021. Um, but it's very interesting to watch and uh, and we're all watching with keen interest. Yeah. All right, well, that was the last official question, um, but I do want to give you all the opportunity before we close, if you want to, you know, say any final key messages or, uh, you know, where people can reach you for uh, more information, uh, that type of thing. We'll just go around uh, the circle, starting with you, if you don't mind, Cara, just because. That's where the circuit starts on my particular computer. Absolutely. Kara Mullally, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter and corning.com. Uh, we have uh, the community broadband pages. So if you do corning.com forward slash uh, community broadband, you can find uh, a wealth of information aimed at this market in particular. Thank you. Christopher? Uh, yeah. Um... Twitter or email is probably the best way to reach me. I'm um, in Twitter. It's Ali underscore Christopher. Uh, email it's um, Cali, C-A-L-I at Virginia.edu. You can also find me at the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. Um, I have a LinkedIn page, but it, it's not particularly current. I think I might still have blue hair in my picture. Um, but uh, email and Twitter definitely are the best ways to reach me. Okay. And a new book coming up. And a new book. Right. Let's not forget. Um, September. September. Yep. Uh, Isaac. Oh, you're just muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Isaac Feiner. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Is probably the best way, uh, or just visit our website, cssystems.com. And we have a, a pretty awesome little uh, chat robot there. Uh, so if you're interested in, in our demand aggregation platform service zones, you can specifically ask for it there, or if it's more open access in general or our operations platform business engine, you can also uh, 
use a chatbot and you will be directed in the in the right direction to get in contact with us or me. Perfect. Thank you. And Sam. That leaves me. Um, so Sam Sam Pratt um, Sam dot Pratt at rendernetworks.com. Um, tons of resources at um, resources dot rendernetworks.com. Uh, I'm currently in Australia. It's very difficult to get into the US. Um, so so uh, online is the best way to get onto me personally uh, on Twitter um, at Sam Pratt and uh, and LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, that's how to reach out and get in contact. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure um, sharing the Zoom stage uh, with the three of you. Um, thank you so much for your time and, and, and I appreciate everyone's uh, attendance and interest in what we had to say today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for all to all of you. Uh, the panel was absolutely fantastic. Great, great information. And, and uh, this follow up session was great as well. So we appreciate your time. Uh, and so thank you. And thank you for everyone who's uh, viewing and attending uh, this this virtual um, media Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you.